In this lesson, we are going to study countable sets. A set A is called countably infinite if it has the same cardinality as the set of natural numbers. So that is, my A is equivalent to the set of natural numbers. A set is called countable if it is either finite or countably infinite. So we have discussed the finite sets and the countably infinite infinite sets. So what are examples of finite sets? Of course, here we have n, k, or of course, the empty set. Countably infinite set, of course, that's the set of natural numbers itself. From our previous video lecture, we have also shown that the set of natural numbers is equivalent to the set n. So therefore, it is also countably infinite. In our last video lesson for this course, we will be discussing uncountable sets. And definitely, uncountable sets are going to be infinite. How do countably infinite sets look like? A set is countably infinite if you can list all of its elements in a non-repeating infinite list. Why is that? Because if A is countably infinite, there exists a bijection, let's call that F, from the set of natural numbers to a. So just like what we did with finite sets, we can make the correspondence. The image of 1 is going to be a sub 1. The image of 2 is a sub 2. And then n goes to a sub n and so on. So hence, the list of a can be listed. You can form a list. And that set is going to be infinite. But when you list it, this listing means that you are not skipping any element. Which of the following lists prove that the set of integers is countably infinite? So for example, if we're going to look at 1, definitely this is no. Why is that? This listing is repeating. It has to be non-repeating to make sure that the function is going to be a bijection. What about this one? Here you are listing the set of integers as 0, and then negative 1, 1, negative 2, 2, and so on. So we started with counting it from 0. So that's 1, 2, 3, and then 4, and then 5, and so on. So that gives this 1 to 1 correspondence. So the answer here is yes. So take note that when you are proving that a set is countably infinite, you have to put all of its elements into a list and you do not skip elements and you do not repeat. Otherwise, you didn't really create a bijection. Why is it true that we should not skip any element? Because we want to make sure that the function is surjective and we do not repeat elements because we want the function to be injective. Here are examples of countable sets. The empty set is countable because in the first place, it is finite. And a finite set is a countable set. This is also a finite set, so therefore this is countable. The set Z, we have shown that this is equivalent to the set of natural numbers, so therefore this is countably infinite. From lecture 43, we have shown that the set of even integers is equivalent to the set of integers. But the set of even integers is equivalent to the set n. So therefore, this is countably infinite. So again, just to see how countable sets look like, you are either one of these two. You are finite. So meaning you can write your a as this list. Or... A is countably infinite. You can write A as this list. And the list will never stop. Just like what we did with finite sets, we want to know what will happen when we operate on countable sets. What will happen when we get subsets of countable sets, when we get its union, and when we get its Cartesian product. So here's the first result. Let A be a subset of a countable set B. Then A must be countable. How do we interpret this? This is saying that any subset of a countable set is 
countable. So in terms of Venn diagram, if A is countable, then any set inside A is going to be countable as well. So before we proceed with the proof, let us give specific examples and then we will generalize this in our proof. So suppose that this is just scratch or sort of illustration so that you know how the proof works. Our premise here is that B is countable, so therefore we can write it as B1, B2, B3, and so on. Let us suppose that if A is finite, then we are done. A is already countable. So let us assume that A is infinite. Then we need to show that A is countably infinite. So suppose that our A is, let's say, B4, B7, B9, B13, and so on. How are we going to write the elements of A? We are going to take A sub 1 to be the element in B whose subscript is the smallest possible subscript such that it belongs in A. This is going to be our A sub 2. This is going to be our A sub 3 and so on. Of course, this is just to give you an intuition of how the proof will look like. So let us prove this formally. Let's start with the premise. Let us also write B as this set. B1, B2, it will never end. Since B is countable and a countable set is either finite or infinite, then we have to have proof by cases. So for our first case, B is finite. Then from our video lesson on lecture 44, any subset of a finite set is already finite. And so A is already countable. For our second case, B is countably infinite. So here I will have subcases for A. If A is empty, then automatically A is countable because A is going to be finite. So therefore, we now suppose that A is not empty. It's like this is case 2A and this is going to be case 2B. So suppose that A is not equal to the empty set. We will show that either A is finite or A is countably infinite. So since A is not empty, we will give a name for the first element of A. So we let a sub 1 be the element in A such that such that it has the smallest subscript when considered as an element in B. So again, if we take a look at our example here, now consider the subscript. So here we have the subscripts 4, 7, 9, 13, and so on, right? By the well-ordering principle, any subset of the set of natural numbers has a smallest element. So we now call the element in A wherein it has the smallest subscript when it is considered as an element of B. So next, we now consider the set A minus A sub 1. Going back to this example here, my A minus the set a sub 1 is B7, B9, B13, and so on. Right? So similarly, we will now call A sub 2 the element here which has the smallest subscript when considered as an element of B. Alright? So that's why my A sub 2 is going to be B sub 7. By the way, there are two things that can happen with A minus A sub 1. If A minus A sub 1 is empty, that means that the only element of A is A sub 1. Correct? And so, A is finite. So, therefore, it is countable. If A minus the set containing A sub 1 is non-empty, then we will again take A2 to be the 
element in E such that it has the smallest subscript when considered as an element in B. So we just continue this process and we will continue giving names to the elements of A and this is either empty or non-empty. If it is empty, A is finite and so it is countable because A is going to be the set A sub 1 up to A sub n. Otherwise, when this set will never be empty, our set A is now going to be A sub 1, A sub 2, and it will continue indefinitely. So that takes care of the proof. A is going to be countable. Next, if A and B are countable, then its union is also countable. So take note that for countable, we have two cases. It's either they are finite or countably infinite. For this proof, I am just going to prove the case when A and B are both countably infinite. So I'm just going to assume that A and B are both infinite. If they are countably infinite, then that means that A is equal to A sub 1, A sub 2, and so on. And then my B is B sub 1, B sub 2, and so on. We want to show that its union is also countably infinite, right? How do we now show that A union B is countably infinite? We have to list the elements of A union B without skipping any elements. How are we going to do that? We do that by first listing the element of A and then the element of B and then go back to A and then B. So meaning to say it's A1, B1, A2, B2, right? So we are not skipping any element. A3, B3, and so on. So therefore, the union of A and B is countably infinite. Now for case 2, I will leave it up to you. What if one of one of A and B is finite and the other is countably infinite? This is an exercise. And of course, for our case three, what would be case three? A and B are both finite. But we have already seen in lecture 44 that the union of two finite sets is again another finite set. So no need to prove that. Now strictly speaking, we can also create a bijection from A union B to N. What will it be? Take note when we are counting, that means we are setting up the bijection. This is when we are counting A union B. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. So therefore, what is our bijection? So F from N to A union B, we define it as F of N is equal to, take a look at this one. When N is even, we have 2, 4, 6, and so on. We go to the elements of B. So it's going to be BK if n is equal to 2k for some k, right? And it's going to be a sub k if n is equal to 2k plus 1. So that is the bijection if you really want to prove it formally. We now generalize what we have seen in the previous slide. So from the previous slide, it says that the union of two countable sets is countable. So we are not only confined to two sets, we can actually have union of k countable sets. So this one is saying that if all of these components are countable and we have k of this, this union is going to be countable. In other words, a finite union of countable sets is countable. An even stronger statement is that even if this union does not end and the components are all countable, the union is going to be countable. In other words, a countably infinite union of countable sets is again countable. 
So when we combine this and this, it's saying that a countable union of countable sets is countable. Because here, it's either we have a finite union or countably infinite union. So that's countable union of countable sets. So the proof of one follows directly from the previous slide and all you have to do is to use induction. I am going to prove part two. So we assume that all the A sub I's are countable. So without loss of generality, I am just going to assume that all of them are countably infinite. So again, just like what we did with the proof of showing that the union of two countable sets is countable, we have to make sure that we can list all the elements of the union without skipping any element. So let's say that A sub 1 is A11 and so on. And of course, this one here will continue. I wrote the elements here in such a way that the first subscript here refers to the subscript over here. So I know that these are all the elements of A sub 1 because the first entries here are all 1. So it tells you where that element belongs to. In general, what I'm trying to say is that A, I, J is an element of what set? It's an element of A sub I because this subscript here is I and it is the jth element of A sub I. How are we going to write down the elements of the union of A sub I, I from 1 to infinity? That is A1, union A2, union A3, union A4, and so on. It will never end. So first, I start with A11, go right. And then, once I go right, go diagonally left. And then, go down. And then, go up. Once you reach the, the first row, you now go right again and then go diagonal to the left. Down, down, down. And then once you reach this, go diagonal again. Diagonal, diagonal, diagonal. Once you reach this, you go to the right. So that is how you are going to write the elements of the union. This is just to give you an intuition. I will not give a formal bijection for this one. I just want you to see that the union is really countably infinite when all of the sets are countably infinite. Next, if A and B are countable, then its Cartesian product is countable as well. Again, for the proof of this one, I am just going to assume that both A and B are countably infinite. And then I will show that the product is countably infinite also. In order to prove this, we need the following lemma. The set N cross N is countable. I will first define my A sub I to be the set of ordered pairs whose first entry is i, and then 1, this is i2, and so on. So this is similar to the a sub i that we encountered in lecture 44, if you can still remember that. Now take note again that these sets are pairwise disjoint. What else? The union of all of these a sub i's is the entire n cross n. But what can we say about a sub i's, by the way? These are all countable, in particular countably infinite. Because here, you were, we were able to list down all the elements. But if you really want a formal proof, take note that the bijection is given by function from n to a sub i. So we can define f of n to be, remember f of n is the nth element. What is the nth element here? It's i n. And therefore, what do we have over here? So this is saying that n cross n is the union of this countable 
sets. And our union is countably infinite. Okay? So, let me just write this union as a1, union a2, union, and so on. It will never end. But all of these components are countable or countably infinite. Therefore, from our previous slide, so by slide 11 and this one, this equation star, n cross n is countable, countably infinite in particular. Now, why did I show that the set n cross n is countable to show that this is true? We have this result. If A is equivalent to, let's say, C, and B is equivalent to D, then when we form the Cartesian product of A cross B, then it is equivalent to C cross D. This is from lecture 43 on equivalent sets. Now, to prove this, I am just going to assume that A and B are both countably infinite. So that is... Both of them are equivalent to n. So hence, by this result, a cross b is equivalent to n cross n. But since from our lemma, n cross n is countable, so therefore this is equivalent to n. And this relation is an equivalence relation, so therefore by transitivity, a cross b is equivalent to n. I will also prove the case when at, when one of them is finite. So So let us assume without loss of generality that A is finite. So therefore it is equivalent to NK and therefore our B is the countably infinite set. So, this is equivalent to N. So, hence, my A cross B is equivalent to NK cross N. And this is a subset of N cross N. This is countable. From this result, any subset of a countable set is countable. This is countable, and this is a subset of a countable set, so therefore, this is also countable. So therefore, A cross B is countable. For the case when both of them are finite, no need to give a proof because we have already seen in Lecture 44 that the Cartesian product of finite sets is finite as well. So it's like this is case 1, case 2. For case 3, A and B are finite. Then A times B is also finite, therefore countable. This is from Lecture 44. We can again generalize the results to finite number of countable sets. This is just saying that we have Cartesian product of two countable sets. This is saying that if we have n countable sets and form their Cartesian product, it's still going to be countable. And what do you think is the proof of this? Again, all you have to do is use the principle of mathematical induction. So I will leave it up to you to prove it. So far, we have looked at the sets Z. We also have N. We also have 2Z, right? And all of these are countable. N is a subset of Z. 2Z is a subset of Z. And all of these are countable. In particular, countably infinite. Now, the next question that you would like, that we would like to consider is, is the set of rational numbers countably infinite? So, we want to know whether Q is here or Q is also inside this set. Well, it turns out that Q is going to be inside this set as well. 
Q is the biggest set here because it contains all of this. However, when we regard their cardinality, they all have the same cardinality. So in a sense, we cannot really say that Q is the biggest because all of them are equivalent. All of these sets are equivalent to N. So since they are all equivalent to N, they have a one-to-one -one correspondence with this one. So therefore, they all have the same size. So we want to show that Q is countably infinite. Now, in order to prove this, I will first show that the set Q plus is countably infinite. This is the set of positive rational numbers. I will just give you a way of listing the elements of Q plus. So what I'm going to do is to list all the positive rational numbers as follows. How are we going to write down the elements of Q plus? So I will use diagonal lines. So here, first, 1, 1. And then if the number is not in lowest terms, I will not just include it in my list. So here is 1, 1, 2 over 1, 1 half, then 3. I will no longer include 2 over 2. That one and so on. This one will continue. We call this process Cantor's diagonalization process. And again, we are not including the elements which are not in lowest terms. So for example, 4 over 2, we will not include that. 3 over 3, 2 fourths, we will not include that. And that will continue. If you want a more formal proof, you can define a function f from q plus to the set n cross n. So remember, we already know that n cross n is countable, correct? So what will be the most natural way to define this? An element in q plus is of this form, a over b, where a and b must be positive integers. And A over B is in lowest terms. So here, A over B is in lowest terms. We define this to be equal to AB. Now verify that F is injective. However, F is not surjective because there are going to be extra elements in N cross N. So for example, we know that 2, 4 will not have a corresponding element here because supposedly this is f of 2 over 4, but 2 over 4 is f of 1 half. f of 1 half will go to 1, 2, not 2, 4. So since it is not surjective, it's easy to give a remedy for that. What we can do now is instead of making the codomain n cross n, I will just redefine f to be q plus to the range of f, right? To make sure that we no longer have extra elements. Again, my f of a over b is still equal to a b. Now take note here that if this is the case, f is already bijective, meaning to say the set q plus is equivalent to the range of f, but the range of f is a subset of n cross n. And again, n cross n is countable, and therefore, any subset of a countable set is also countable. So since q plus is equivalent to that, meaning to say this is equivalent to the set of natural numbers, q plus is also countable. Lastly, we can now prove that the set of rational numbers is countably infinite. So the proof of that is the set Q is just the union of Q plus union, the set containing zero and the set containing all the negative rational numbers. Now, 
Again, another exercise. Show that Q plus is equivalent to Q minus. I will already start you with the proof. What will be the most natural bijection between Q plus and Q minus? If I have an A over B here in Q plus, we will just send it to negative A over B. Correct? And verify that this is A bijection. So therefore, Q plus is countable, Q minus is countable, and zero is a finite set, so therefore it is countable. So since Q plus, zero, and Q minus are all countable, their union is also countable.